So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Atiku Rahman Ahad from University of Dhaka. And at this moment, I'm at Osaka University. So today uh, in the uh, keynote speech series of ICIEV and IVPR, uh, International Conference on Informatics, Electronics and Vision and International Conference on Imaging Vision and Pattern Recognition. Uh, this series, uh, Professor Nikola Banovic uh, from uh, uh, University of Michigan and Arbor. Uh, he's an amazing speaker, wonderful researcher. I met him a number of times and uh, uh, we are in uh, uh, very much connected. So I'm uh, very delighted to have uh, Nicola uh, uh, as a keynote speaker for this uh, series. So uh, Nicola mm, did his PhD uh, mm, uh, at uh, CMU uh, and uh, BSc and Masters uh, from University of Toronto. And uh, his work is on uh, human computer interaction and uh, explainable AI and others. And he has published a, a good series of great papers as well as uh, some award winning research as well. So without any further delay, I would like to request uh, uh, Dr. Nicola Venovic uh, to start his uh, presentation. So uh, Nicola, please start. Thank you so much for, uh, for the lovely introduction. And uh, thank you all uh, for coming to this talk. I know that we have audience from uh, many different parts of the world. Uh, some of you are probably like me, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, going through your morning routine. It's 9 a.m. Uh, some of you are as late as uh, 10 p.m. Uh, so again, I really appreciate that you came to hear this talk. Uh, today I'll talk uh, more about one of my uh, research threads uh, where I look at uh, the challenges of explainability and inter interpretability uh, through interaction. Uh, but before I tell you more about that, I just want to uh, put this research in a bit of a context. So I am a computer scientist, but most of my research focuses on uh, the area of human computer interaction or HCI. And like any other HCI researcher, I'm very interested in understanding people's behaviors, uh, understanding their goals, understanding the tasks that they perform to reach those goals, and then using this knowledge uh, to understand where technology can play a role, where it should not play a role in trying to help people accomplish their tasks so that we can either inform the design of future user interfaces or uh, help improve the existing user interfaces that we have. Uh, but there is a little twist on uh, this whole HCI research. In my work, I primarily leverage computational modeling approaches to understanding people's behaviors. And this computational modeling approach isn't anything new. Uh, we see it in many different sciences. We see it in engineering. Right? So you don't see engineers uh, creating uh, airplane wings, attaching them to the airplane and then testing them by flying uh, these airplanes right away. Right. And potentially, you know, uh, these airplanes falling down. Instead, what you do is you express this wing uh, mathematically. Uh, you express the environment in which the wing will find itself mathematically. And then what you do is you simulate different situations that the wing will find itself in you predict how the wing will behave. And only when you're certain that the wing design that you actually have is working, only then you empirically test it uh, by flying an actual airplane with that new wing that you, um, you have uh, created. And this is something that I would actually like to see uh, more of in our own HCI work, leveraging these computational models, leveraging these computational modeling approaches of simulating and predicting uh, in HCI as well. And this is not foreign to HCI audiences. We had computational models, or at least models, of uh, both uh, how people uh, uh, act, uh, even uh, going all the way down to perhaps uh, trying to describe some aspects of their uh, cognition, uh, their perception. Uh, some of you may even be familiar with some of the uh, famous models of motor behavior in HCI, such as, for example, Fitzlaw, where we use it to compute how long it takes for 
uh, the user to click on a particular target using their cursor or, or uh, their finger, where this target is at a certain distance uh, and the target has a certain width, right? And now we have this model where we can um, express the index of difficulty or how difficult it is to press on this target at this distance and width, or any distance for that matter, and any width, uh, given some parameters A and B that we estimate uh, from empirical studies. Uh, and then what we do uh, is we use these kinds of uh, models, uh, both pointing, perception, and uh, cognition uh, in actually uh, modeling uh, different user interfaces, simulating uh, the different situations that uh, users find themselves in and predicting, for example, how fast it takes them to interact with the interface. And the usual example and uh, 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 sort of an area in which I have done a lot of work is uh, text entry, right? Where the user is pressing on different keys, right? Selecting targets uh, in this user interface where the user might uh, also make some errors, right? Like for example, trying to spell hello and uh, spell I instead of O, uh, and in which case the user has to go uh, press on the delete key and correct this error. This is everything that we actually want to model uh, when we are trying to express this kind of uh, behavior, this kind of interaction. Uh, and here I will just uh, briefly show you uh, how uh, this modeling actually looks like in one of the uh, frameworks that we have developed uh, at my lab, uh, in which we are able to actually uh, model how people transcribe uh, text. So here what you're seeing is you're seeing uh, an interface, you're seeing a certain kind of device, you're seeing this big circle where the user is looking uh, to enter different um, characters, reading the text that the, the user needs to enter, pressing on different keys using the thumb that is depicted with this little blue dot that is traveling around, uh, if you're able to see it. And what is interesting here is that not only uh, are we presenting how people uh, type, we also present how people make errors. So what we're trying to do is come as close to the actual uh, real user experience uh, as possible to the point where we can actually leverage some of these models uh, in early stages to replace some of the very costly empirical studies. Now, that's an interesting example, but uh, human behaviors are not just situated uh, in front of their laptop computers or even just while holding their phone uh, in front of their face. The behavior is situated in uh, these very complex environments. And some of the tasks that people perform are a lot more uh, complex than um, just the typing on the text. Uh, uh, it's, it's not even about uh, sitting in place. Uh, some of these interactions happen while uh, we are on the go. Uh, and one of the interesting things that has happened uh, recently is that we have, um, uh, we, we now have the technology that allows us to sense, collect, and store massive amount of data uh, about people from their uh, personal devices, their mobile devices, uh, their uh, um, wearables, uh, and so on, uh, where we really now have the data about almost any aspect of people's lives, uh, about uh, their daily routines at their homes, their exercising routines, how they interact with, routinely with some of these devices, and even things like how they drive, how they operate uh, their vehicles. Uh, and one of the challenges in sort of using this kind of data to uh, understand people, to understand their behaviors, is because uh, this data is stored in these massive behavior logs uh, that contain heterogeneous, multivariate, often unlabeled data. Uh, and some of the existing techniques that we have, like exploratory data analysis or even automated data mining methods, uh, really uh, do not offer um, uh, ways for us to explore this data in a meaningful way uh, that ensures that any patterns that we are able to extract from the data actually match the patterns of uh, people's behaviors, that actually match the processes that generated uh, this data. So in some of my work, I have created these models that try to capture uh, people's uh, behaviors, where we can express a behavior or define it as a behavior instance, a sequence of situations that people find themselves in and the actions that they perform in those situations to reach certain goals. 
And then what we can do is we can build these probabilistic models that capture the probabilities of people performing different actions in different situations and their transitions between different situations in response to those actions or more broadly in response to changes uh, in, the, uh, in, in, um, in the environment. And when you're having these uh, kind of models and when you want to use them to understand people's uh, uh, behaviors uh, that really represent one of the main goals of computational modeling uh, in HCI. Um, and the second goal, once you actually have these kinds of models, once you understand people's behaviors captured in those models, you also want to leverage those models to enable what I like to call behavior aware user interfaces. User interfaces that can automatically act uh, in response to uh, people's uh, behaviors. So this brings us to sort of one of the main challenges that we're going to be talking about in this talk. Uh, and that is that most of the time when we want to leverage these kinds of models to explain people's behaviors or more broadly, when we, when we look at uh, current state of uh, uh, research in explainability, in particular in machine learning, right? Trying to understand complex machine learning models. Uh, Existing research often assume that the end user who will be trying to understand those models or understand any complex systems based on those models, that they are actually a math savvy model designer rather than some kind of a domain expert or end user that may or may not have knowledge in math, in statistics, in machine learning. Actually, it is more likely that they will not have this kind of knowledge. So in my own work, what I'm really interested in is studying how we can enable domain experts and end users to explore capabilities and limitations of complex models, including machine learning models, AI-based models, even complex systems that might not even use machine learning but are complex enough or are uh, not transparent uh, for somebody to just come and, and explore the model itself that way through interaction with the model or the system itself. So in this talk, what I will do is I will guide you through three different uh, projects that I have done in which we explore this concept of explainability, inter interpretability, even intelligibility through interaction. In the first one, we're going to look at a user interface, a behavior aware user interface uh, that we have created that helps raise awareness uh, uh, of drivers about their uh, aggressive behaviors, where the interface itself is powered by a complex model of people's driving behaviors. Then we're going to look at how some of these techniques can actually be used to help domain experts audit complex systems that may or may not be based on some of these machine learning models. Uh, and then I actually want to uh, give you a bit of a preview of um, one of our projects that was accepted to appear in CHI 2021. Uh, so you will see uh, a presentation of that project uh, before the CHI audience actually uh, sees it, in which we have created uh, an interactive tool uh, that we can use to explore generative adversarial networks, or GANs for short, uh, in particular to explore their outputs to better understand the capabilities and limitations of some of these uh, models. All right, so then we can move on to the first project or the behavior aware user interface that I just mentioned to you. Now, the motivation behind these kinds of uh, uh, interfaces is that aggressive driving is a cause of many collisions, uh, in particular in the United States, um, some of them even uh, fatal collisions. And uh, the challenge here is how do we uh, get people to actually drive uh, less aggressively? Now, of course, there are ways that we currently deal with these things in, in policy. Uh, so drivers that have had traffic violations related to aggressive driving, uh, they often have to go through additional training. Sometimes this training involves specific driving instructors that focus on aggressive driving. 
Uh, and then uh, once they go through these tests, usually they're able to get their li driver's license back. The challenge is that we don't always have these driving instructions, uh, you know, to sit next to every single aggressive driver we have. So instead, uh, what we are interested in is creating user interfaces that can, at the very least, raise awareness of drivers' aggressive behaviors when they occur and use the ability of these um, interfaces to actually coach drivers what non-aggressive drivers would do in the same uh, situation. So what you're seeing in this uh, video uh, is an interface that shows two vehicles. One is a transparent vehicle that is currently speeding through uh, the intersection. That is an actual behavior of an actual driver where we used our underlying model to automatically detect that that instance of driving behavior is aggressive. And then you see the opaque, the white vehicle that is going through the intersection sort of at or a little bit over uh, the speed limit, which is actually what we simulated using our models. And this is a simulated behavior of what non-aggressive driver would do in the same situation. So here, what I will guide you through is very briefly how we created this model and then a user study in which we evaluated the ability of this kind of an interface um, to, to help drivers uh, understand what is it that the model is uh, capturing and what is it that the model is trying to uh, coach them to do. Okay. So to train this model, uh, to train uh, or to implement this uh, interface, and to train the underlying models of both aggressive and non-aggressive driving behavior, we collected naturalistic driving data from actual drivers in Pittsburgh area. This was uh, close to 50,000 uh, intersections that people drove through uh, from over 1,000 trips. Um, and uh, what we were able to do is capture about 7,000 different situations uh, that people found themselves in and 446 different driving actions that they performed in uh, those uh, situations. So what we have done is we then took that data, we expressed it as different features of this model where we both captured uh, the features that describe the situations people find themselves in, the kinds of maneuvers that they have uh, performed, the kinds of uh, intersections that they found themselves in, uh, the different positions in the intersection that they find themselves in, and so on, and the different kinds of actions that they perform in those uh, situations. And then what we have done is we ran an inverse reinforcement learning based algorithm to estimate the probabilities of different actions that the drivers perform in these uh, different uh, situations. Now, I don't necessarily want to focus too much on the model itself because I actually want to get to the point of explainability uh, through interaction uh, that, that, uh, or different interactions that we can design to, to help people understand what the model has actually captured. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is a model that uh, is trying to capture different behavior instances. Now, having this kind of a probabilistic model now allows us to um, probabilistically reason about uh, some of these behaviors, right? So we can compute the probability of a behavior instance uh, given some kind of a routine model, right? So for example, we can have a model of aggressive driving behavior. We can have a model of non-aggressive driving behavior that we train on, on the data that I just described. And the question is given any behavior, what is the probability of that behavior given one of these models? But also what we can do is we can calculate the probability that the behavior instance is characteristic of a particular routine. So if I observe a behavior instance, the question is, is it more likely that this is aggressive driving behavior? Or is it more likely that this is a non-aggressive driving behavior? And then what we can do is we can actually create classifiers out of these um, uh, probabilities where uh, depending on the probability that we calculate um, uh, how characteristic behavior instances of a particular uh, model, we can then actually decide whether <coughs> 
whether that instance is an instance of aggressive driving behavior or non-aggressive driving behavior. And we can even um, uh, use some of these parameters that tell us how confident we want to be about our prediction. And then what we have done is we actually ran, um, uh, ran our model on the data, uh, on, the, on the testing data that uh, we kind of held out from the data set that I uh, told you about. And what you're able to see here on the x-axis is what, uh, the, um, what the model uh, has actually classified different behavior instance S. So either it's, it classified it as uh, aggressive, uh, non-aggressive, or neither, right? We have that opportunity, depending on how we set our alpha parameter, we can also say we're not we're not certain whether this is aggressive or non-aggressive and, and choose not to classify the, the instance itself. And then what you see here is uh, colors that represent the weak label that we have assigned uh, to the behavior instance uh, before we built our model. And the way we assigned these weak labels is we said, okay, any behavior instance from a driver that had uh, any traffic violation related to aggressive driving, we're going to put in a bucket and we're going to train an aggressive driving model from that uh, uh, bucket of data. And then all of those people who haven't yet had a traffic violation related to aggressive driving, we'll put them in another bucket and kind of assume that, okay, most likely there are some non-aggressive uh, driving, uh, behavior driving instances in that bucket. And then we train these models and we let the, uh, probability uh, calculations that I showed you later on, uh, determining what uh, actual uh, bucket this uh, behavior instance belongs to. Uh, so now what you're seeing then on the uh, y-axis is the percentage of instances that we have uh, classified uh, uh, as either aggressive, non-aggressive, or neither. So now, what you can see, for example, for an alpha level of 75, where we want to be fairly certain that if we're detecting a behavior instance as aggressive, that truly it is aggressive. Uh, and then, of course, you can be a little bit more lenient and you can say, okay, well, I just want to classify all of these behavior instances either into aggressive or non-aggressive. Don't, don't put anything into neither. Uh, I, I just, you know, I, I want to be I don't, I don't care to be very confident. I just want them in these two different buckets. And one of the things that you will notice here is that uh, across these different alpha levels, you will see that all of the um, uh, aggress uh, whenever the, the model detected uh, an aggressive driving uh, instance, uh, most of the time these uh, behavior instances came from these aggressive uh, drivers, right? Weakly labeled aggressive drivers. And similarly, we see that most of the uh, non-aggressive instances came from uh, seemingly non-aggressive drivers. But you will also notice that uh, sometimes drivers who uh, we labeled weakly as non-aggressive still drive aggressively. And even drivers who are supposedly aggressive, sometimes they drive non-aggressively too. And what is uh, important to note here is that aggressiveness isn't a binary thing. Uh, we all agree, uh, engage in aggressive driving behaviors at certain times. It's just that certain drivers engage in those behaviors more often, okay? So now what becomes interesting is how can we then actually detect these driving instances when uh, they happen? But before doing that, what we wanted to do is to make sure that our um, uh, algorithm has actually correctly classified uh, some of these instances. So we wanted to evaluate the ability of the algorithm to, aggress uh, to detect aggressive driving and simulate non-aggressive driving instances. So what we did is we recruited two driving instructors and we actually gave them the interface that I showed you earlier to look at the uh, behavior instances that we are asking them about because it would be really difficult for them to look into the raw data or simply look at those, um, uh, those uh, probabilities or uh, those uh, you know, accuracy calculations that I have shown you uh, in the previous slides. To them, that doesn't really mean much. But looking at the actual simulation or an actual animation of, of a behavior helps them understand it better. And what they have found is that our algorithm 
at the alpha level of uh, 50%, correctly detected 72% of aggressive driving instances. 5% of these instances were incorrect, meaning uh, these driving instructors said, oh no, it was, uh, it was wrong. Uh, the algorithm was wrong. That is not an aggressive driving instance. And the instructors themselves said that 23% of these are neither. They just simply could not tell based on the behavior that we animated. And similar thing happened with uh, detecting non-aggressive driving instances. 85% were correct, 5% were incorrect, and 10% they said, we just cannot tell. And what was interesting is that they said that algorithm or the system itself provided a reasonable non-aggressive driving alternative for each correctly detected aggressive driving behavior. So whenever we simulated a behavior, which we wanted to be non-aggressive, it truly was non-aggressive. So now what we wanted to do is see whether we can use this kind of interface to raise actual drivers' um, uh, awareness of their own driving behaviors. Again, note that simply showing them probabilities of their actions in some kind of a probabilistic model wouldn't necessarily help them understand what the model is trying to tell them to do. So we recruited uh, 20 participants, who drove through 120 predefined intersections each. We split them into two groups. In one group, we just animated uh, uh, what they have uh, done, uh, all of the behavior instances, all of the different uh, intersections. Uh, and then in the second condition, we actually used our tool and show them only uh, behavior instances where the model detected that they were driving aggressively. And then we also gave them an ability to play what non-aggressive driver would do in that same situation uh, so that they can sort of compare what is it that they have done and what is it that non-aggressive driver would do. And then both of these group rated their driving behaviors in a pre and a post uh, test where we asked them to rate how aggressive they think they are. We also had some distractor questions where we asked them how experienced they think they are and so on, just so they don't really understand that this whole study was just about aggressive driving. And we also asked them about very specific instances of behavior, whether they engage and how frequently they engage in that kind of behavior and whether they think that that behavior makes them aggressive. So for example, we may ask them, how frequently do you rush through the yellow light uh, in an intersection? Uh, and how aggressive do you think that, uh, uh, or how aggressive do you think that makes you? Um, so then they rated their sort of subjective opinions about their own aggressiveness. And one of the things that we've noticed is that when we ask somebody, you know, how aggressive are you? Uh, there was no difference between the pre and post tests, regardless of, what condition or what interface they use, they simply wouldn't change their overall um, understanding of their aggressiveness. But <clears throat> what we have found is that the participants in the test group were 40% more likely to identify individual aggressive driving behaviors in the post test. The tool itself, the presentation of their behaviors, the presentation of <clears throat> what non-aggressive drivers would do made them more sensitized to their own aggressive driving behaviors. So if we were to look back at this kind of an interface, um, we can learn that automatically detecting behaviors that are relevant to the user, to, to their own behaviors, uh, enables them to identify <clears throat> the regions of interest in the model, right? This is, this is a massive model, but where should we uh, help end users look? Well, we should help them look in the regions that they are interested in. And then <clears throat> another insight here is that con contrasting actual behaviors with simulated behaviors enables the users to explore how the model performs in alternative situations. Okay, so that was, one work. Now I want to move on and give you an example where the system that or the algorithm or however you want to call it, a model uh, that you're trying to understand or the user is trying to understand does not necessarily lends itself 
to uh, understanding. And I want to illustrate this on um, a recent work by one of the students working with me, uh, in which we uh, try to perform algorithmic audit on e-government systems. Now, for some of you that may not be familiar, e-government uh, basically enables provision of state services through technological communication devices. And one of the main reasons for wanting to Im implement e-government is that it supposedly improves access, right? People who otherwise would not be able to get access to some of these services can now uh, do it easily through the internet. Uh, and of course, from the perspective of the government, uh, these kinds of systems reduce administrative workload because they in many ways replace some of the, the workers that the government would otherwise have to uh, employ or allows those workers to focus on more uh, important uh, cases. However, uh, the problem here is that often these kinds of systems come with errors. Uh, and there's a huge impact for people who are affected. So for example, if a person is uh, coming to this website and is trying to apply for cash assistance or some kind of welfare support or food stamps or uh, childcare assistance, and these kinds of systems deny this uh, uh, kind of service or this kind of support by mistake, uh, then these people leave without any help. Uh, and Another challenge here is that these can really be hard to detect because the users themselves, the end users, uh, they don't necessarily have the right information to tell whether uh, uh, an, an error actually occurred, whether they were denied government benefits uh, because they don't, uh, they're not supposed to get them or because the system made uh, an error. And it becomes even more uh, difficult to contest some of these because again, they are case by case basis. Often there is no paper trail uh, when it comes to some of these decisions. Uh, so it is a really, really challenging uh, problem. Uh, so what we have done here is we uh, looked for ways that we can uh, sort of automatically interact with some of these th systems to detect errors before they even affect people. Uh, and through that kind of interaction, we wanted to make these embedded errors more visible so that the organizations who actually run these kinds of websites can, uh, or, or um, uh, sort of advocate, advocacy groups or individual users can actually uh, articulate demands for change for uh, um, sort of ad, um, demands to address these kinds of uh, issues. So just to give you an idea of what uh, these kind of uh, systems look like, I want to illustrate it on screening tools. So what these screening do, tools do is they accept some kind of estimated information. It's not necessarily all of the information that the person would have to uh, provide to these kinds of websites about you know, their household, people living in the household. And then these tools, they predict whether or not this particular household would qualify for a particular uh, benefit, right? And then, you know, the, the thing here is that these screening tools really uh, are meant to help end users because otherwise they would have to go through these very, very complex el eligibility handbooks that they are sure not to understand, right? So there's still some benefit in these kinds of screening tools if they are working uh, correctly. But to ensure that they are working correctly, we need to create different auditing uh, uh, tools because uh, it is not enough to just say, uh, please give us the source code. Um, well, we actually asked for the source code and the state of Pennsylvania, uh, which we used to illustrate our tool, uh, responded back and said, um, we're sorry, but the security of our state is at stake. We cannot uh, give you the source code. So even simple if then else statement become really, really difficult to understand when you have no insight into these statements. So instead, we had to look for other ways to edit this uh, particular uh, screening tool uh, called do I qualify. So the way we have gone about this is using a computational method. So here's what we've done. In our method, we first generate test households. Okay, we take 
a lot of different external data sets that describe realistic households and people living in those households in the United States. And for this, we use different uh, a census, US census data sets. We combine these data sets using different data transformation and merge scripts to create a test household data set that represents synthetic people, people that don't necessarily exist, but are yet representative of people living in the United States. And then what we do is we take these realistic test households and then we run them through a screening tool automation script that simulates how these users, these uh, synthetic, these simulated users would actually interact with the screening tool itself. We send those requests to the remote servers um, of the screening tool and we uh, do this by uh, automation of the interface. So we actually implemented this using um, uh, Selenium. Some of you might be familiar with this. Uh, this is just a little animation to show you how our system is uh, going through uh, making changes to the different uh, questions uh, of this interface. Of course, in our final uh, simulation, we didn't have to you know, uh, animate every single uh, uh, form that we have submitted, but this at least gives you an idea of how this happens uh, behind the scenes. Uh, and then we uh, get back, oops, sorry, we get back responses from the servers where the server says, okay, for this household, I say, yes, you should, you should get this benefit. For some other households, they shouldn't get these benefits. And then what we have done is we looked in the actual eligib eligibility rules. And then we had a legal expert on our team interpret these rules and then create our own formalization of these rules where we can now use this same data set that we have created of these realistic synthetic households. We can run it through this, these rules for formalizations to get our own ground truth determinations. And now when we compare these different determinations, both from the screening tool that we are auditing and our own determinations, we can get a comparison where we can tell what are the true positives, what are the false negatives, what are the true negatives determination, right? And then this allows us to focus on the very specific determinations where uh, the tool and our rules disagree for further examination. And through further examinations, uh, you know, we identified many errors in this tool across many different uh, benefits that uh, the screening tool tests for. Just to give you one, you know, example, uh, we looked at subsidized childcare. And for this particular program, there is a very specific code that describes and says that families with a child who need supervision and whose income falls below 200% of the federal poverty uh, income guideline are eligible. The tool, the screening tool, predicted that no families are eligible for subsidized child care benefit. And in our formalization, because we, we have this synthetic data set, we estimated that at least 4.6% of families in the United States are actually eligible for this benefit. So not only are you able to find where the errors are, create the paper trail. We can also calculate the magnitude of these errors and the effects that it has on uh, the society. And actually, uh, interestingly enough, uh, our work ended up in, in the newspapers, in the media. Um, and um, uh, this prompted the Pennsylvania state officials to actually go back and look into these errors and, and fix them in their own tool. And since, we, uh, since that has happened, we actually looked back and uh, truly they did fix a lot of these errors, not all of them, but a lot of them. So some of the lessons here uh, are that simulating interactions of people with an opaque system can expose inner workings of this system. And these kinds of algorithmic audits uh, generate actionable trails of issues with these complex systems that we can use to fix them. So basically these systems enable the kinds of interactions that we want uh, for let's say these advocacy groups, these domain experts from advocacy groups to 
look at the system, interact with the system in a, in a very specific way to understand and detect these kinds of errors, to detect the, both the capabilities and the limitations of this system. So this brings us to sort of uh, the last uh, project that I want to uh, talk about today, um, where we can actually uh, uh, start thinking about uh, how to encapsulate these interaction in actual user interfaces that help us uh, explore mod model or system capabilities and, lim and uh, limitations through interaction. And uh, here, um, uh, this is a project in which we actually focus on generative adversarial networks. Or GAN, some of you might be familiar with them. They are able to create these never before seen images based on some training data. And very often these days, they're even used as uh, you know, uh, creativity support tools, art support tools. Some of you may have seen that actually there are people out there creating art uh, through these GANs. Uh, and just uh, you know, to make sure that, um, that I introduce these GANs properly, uh, these networks, they, um, they have two components, right? When we're trying to train these networks, there are two components. There's a generator that takes in a vector of some latent variable Z, and based on that vector outputs the corresponding image. So each vector Z maps to a single image. And then we have a discriminator that is used to distinguish between generated images and real images in our training data, right? So in this process of training, the generator is trying to generate more and more and more realistic images, trying to fool the discriminator. And the discriminator is trying to distinguish between real images and generated images until it can no longer tell the difference, until the generator is able to uh, fool this discriminator completely. And in this work, we're very much interested in the generator, in the output of the generator, so that we can better understand uh, the quality of these generated images to assess the capabilities and limitations of this, uh, this model. The challenge here is that this is uh, not an easy thing to do. Uh, there are no good quantitative measures of uh, quality of images. And most of the time, uh, people still evaluate these GANs or explore these GANs through tedious visual examination of galleries, non-interactive image galleries, that are sampled from the model from very prob narrow probability distributions on those parameters Z that I just described in the previous slide. So instead, what we have done, we have created an interactive tool called GAN Explorer that the user can use to explore a GAN and look through different spaces, image spaces inside of this GAN to select quality images, where in this particular case, we define quality as photorealism where the user is trying to find photorealistic images. And the way we do this is by, um, um, sorry, just one moment, by using this uh, interface that provides the users with a tool palette and eight different tools that they can use, uh, a central image gallery, current working image gallery area, where the user can uh, explore different images generated from the GAN. Gallery snapshot area, where the user can uh, create snapshot of some of these galleries to come back to later and explore them. And the selected images that the user um, has uh, 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 marked as photorealistic from this model. So, the way we do this is we basically take this central uh, current working image gallery and we express it mathematically. So each of these images is actually a point on a segment of a plane where we have different vectors that define this plane. And then what we can do is using different mathematical operations on these vectors, we can actually change where the plane or this plane segment is currently looking at 
inside of the model itself. Okay, so then what we do is we define different um, tools or different kinds of interactions and we map them onto those mathematical uh, operations. So for example, one thing that the users can do is they can zoom into a particular region of the model by clicking on the zoom in tool in the tool palette and then clicking on an image inside of the current working gallery where that image where they clicked on becomes the central image of the gallery and the images surrounding it are now more similar to that particular image. We can do a very similar thing with zoom out where the user can select zoom out tool, click on an image, and now that image that they click on is still the central image, but the images around it are less similar to it. And of course, we can do uh, uh, now uh, ki different kinds of operations to zoom in into regions where the user can select a region of images that they want to zoom in, okay? And then we have some other tools. So for example, the user can pan through these, um, uh, through these uh, current working image galleries. So move just, you know, one row or one column to the left, right, top and bottom. They can pivot uh, in which, which is actually not necessarily uh, a pivoting um, uh, operation. It's more like changing where the plane uh, is looking inside of the model. And then they can also uh, fully randomize the current working gallery, start from you know, a completely uh, different uh, uh, area. I'm having a little bit of a slowdown on my machine, so I'm not quite sure if you're able to see uh, these videos in, in real time. So clicking on randomize, uh, completely change the current working gallery. And then of course we have some of these tools that allow uh, the user to take a snapshot of the current working gallery to come back to it later for further processing. They can undo and redo any of their uh, current uh, actions. All right, so now what we wanted to do is to evaluate this GAN Explorer and show that people can actually use it to detect uh, different images. So the first thing that we have done is we created uh, an Amazon or ran an Amazon MTurk study with 375, uh, 367 participants, where we asked them to use our tool and select images from an, an existing GAN model called the Big GAN. And this Big GAN model has thousands of categories. We selected only 10 and asked people to select images from only those 10 categories. And we wanted to know what are the different tools that people interacted with. And we also found that they were able to use these different tools to select over 10,000 GAN generated images using our protocol. Now, in the second study, we wanted to actually evaluate whether these images that the users selected are actually photorealistic. So we conducted another mechanical uh, MTurk study with 1,622 participants, and we asked them to select only photorealistic uh, images from a gallery using a specific labeling tool that we have developed for this study, where we randomly sampled images that um, participants uh, selected in study one, and then asked participant in study two to tell us, is this a photorealistic image or not? And here we found that out of the 10,000 images, um, almost 80% of images were rated as realistic by at least one uh, labeler. Uh, but we also observed a lot of ambiguity in these ratings where uh, raters disagreed what it means to, for an image to be photorealistic. Uh, so then what we have done is we performed visual examination of the top images, images that were uh, labeled as photorealistic by the, at least 75% of participants. Uh, and there we uncovered a, a very diverse set of photorealistic images that we then used on in our next study, where we wanted to compare our image galleries that, that the users were able to select using our tool with these existing sampling methods. Now, the challenge here is that uh, collecting this kind of data from tools like GAN Explorer using crowdsource studies is tedious. Um, we can only uh, collect so many data uh, points, but uh, what we can do is we can actually sample 
from the posterior probability distribution of those Z, uh, latent Z vectors using the images that the users have already or participants have already marked as photorealistic. And then we can create uh, these kinds of galleries and compare them with baseline methods uh, that sample also from these latent vector Z, but from uh, much simpler distributions, uh, some kind of truncated normal distributions where the parameters of the distribution are randomly uh, selected through some kind of heuristics or previous ex empirical experiences. So what we have done is we recruited another 1000 participants. We randomly assigned them to one of 50 conditions uh, where they um, uh, looked at images created using a specific method where the method could have been our method or one of the four uh, baselines uh, or uh, normal distributions truncated at different levels. And then we also uh, wanted to take into account the effect of category, although we primarily focused on trying to understand is there difference in these methods. And we asked people uh, in this study to again uh, select images from uh, a randomly generated image gallery using the same tool that I've shown you in study two. And what we have done is we measured the number of photorealistic images per method. And here you can quickly see how these um, uh, image galleries look like. So you have our method on the left, which through our own examination, visual examinations consistently um, created a more diverse set of photorealistic images than these other baselines on the right. Uh, where you see the different truncation um, uh, truncations at, at different levels, ranging from uh, truncation at two that generates an image gallery that might be diverse, but not necessarily photorealistic, all the way down to um, uh, truncations that for some uh, categories created uh, photorealistic images, but they were certainly not uh, diverse. Uh, and then what we have also done is we ran an aligned uh, rank transform test um, followed by a contra pairwise contrast test. And our test found significant main effect of method on the number of selected images. And we were able, despite all the noise in, in using crowdsource labels, we were able to establish that there's at least one uh, significant difference between our method and one of these um, arbitrarily selected uh, truncation uh, points. Um, so, uh, in summary, what these results show is that our principled method uh, allows us to sample images, uh, uh, not, not just sample images, but also uh, uh, allow people to select images in a more principled way than using these arbitrary hur heuristics, right? Our interactive tool enable principal qualitative exploration of a GAN via interactive visual examination and our automated image gallery generation method enabled quick creation of many of these diverse photorealistic image galleries to then support interactive qualitative evaluation of GANs that uh, even model designers use uh, these days. And actually, if you're interested in demoing GAN Explorer, you can follow the link that you see on the slide. Uh, please be gentle to our servers. This is uh, an actually, um, you know, an actual prototype running uh, on the big GAN um, uh, uh, model. Uh, please go ahead, you know, take a look at videos, take a look at the preprint of the paper, and then in interact with the tool uh, itself. And then, you know, finally, I uh, just want to kind of summarize what you have seen here. Uh, so, uh, you know, our preliminary work really shows some evidence uh, that stakeholders who are not necessarily model designers can interact with these complex systems, right? Whether they are AI-based, ML-based, doesn't really matter. In general, they're complex systems. They are difficult to understand what is it that they're doing, what they can do, what they cannot do, and what kind of outputs they create. Uh, but we do this in a way that can potentially explain system decisions in an interpretable manner. So for future directions, of course, uh, you know, we're now starting to realize that there are perhaps classes or families of different kinds of interactions uh, that we can apply to different kinds of models. So what we want to do is we actually want to identify where the promising threads of research, where are these promising interactions for various kinds of systems, for various kinds of models. Um, and 
what we want to do is then define a family of methods for interpretable explanations of these kinds of uh, model decisions. Um, and what you have seen in, in my talk is that we very often focus on capabilities and limitations of some of these systems, but we really want to go beyond that and start including other factors that impact people in our society more broadly. So start uh, looking at how we can assess ethics, how we can assess fairness of some of these systems, again, through interaction. Thank you very much. It was really a pleasure to give this talk. Uh, thank, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Nicola. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful presentation as always. Uh, uh, I mean, from you. So uh, uh, now uh, we ask the audience to ask any questions. Uh, please uh, feel free to ask uh, questions or any queries. So uh, we can find Arafat Rahman. Arafat Rahman, unmute yourself and please ask. Yes, uh, I'm Arafat Rahman from University of Dhaka. Thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, nowadays deep learning models are very you know, giving very uh, high accuracy, like uh, COVID detection from test X-ray images, but those models are not so interpretable. Uh, is it possible to uh, design a more user-friendly model that can be interpretable, like radiologists can uh, interpret why these deep learning models are giving such high accuracy. Why, uh, the, uh, why uh, those why those models are so good, so that they uh, they can find the shortcomings or uh, so that they can understand why they are good. Uh, this, this is uh, thank you for that question. Uh, it, it's an excellent question, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, one of the students working with me uh, actually works on explainability and interpretability of um, uh, radiology images, uh, particularly focusing on gliomas, uh, which are aggressive uh, uh, form of brain tumors. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of interesting things in your question. Um, one uh, is uh, this uh, claim that the accuracy of this model, models are extremely high. And yet, even you observe that uh, uh, these models are still not necessarily accepted in clinical practice. Well, one of the things that we've noticed through our own work is that metrics like accuracy are highly misleading. Uh, the reason for that is because some of these metrics uh, are what machine learning uh, researchers are used to that they are translating from uh, broad general, uh, let's call it computer vision um, uh, research. Uh, accuracy isn't really used as much as, as, for example, the dice score, right? But even dice score uh, suffers from the same problems where uh, we don't really understand the underlying semantics of the segments that we are creating. So what happens is, Yes, these algorithms are really good at detecting, uh, you know, black areas of MRIs where there is no image there. Yes, they're, they're really good at saying there is no tumor there. Of course, most of the image is actually no tumor whatsoever. Uh, so that inflates measures like accuracy. Uh, and although most of the time they are good at detecting sort of uh, uh, large areas of these tumor masses, they're making a lot of errors on the boundaries. But those boundaries are where it matters the most. It is the difference between leaving the tumor in and cutting into regions of the brain that is going to uh, maybe take away somebody's ability to speak, take away somebody's ability to talk. So the cost of these errors, even the smallest errors at the level of pixels can change people's lives. And that is something that we cannot uh, allow to be hidden by these kinds of metrics. So yes, it's very, very challenging to actually understand what the model is doing and to also understand the output of the model because model also speaks in, in different way or the outputs of the model speak in different ways than the radiologists do. Radiologists usually provide segmentation. They provide um, areas where they are confident about their segmentation, areas where they have questions. They you know, go and talk to super fellows. 
trying to understand, was I really right? There is no such interaction between the model and uh, a radiologist that is simply looking at the output of, of a segmentation. And this is something that we're looking to change. We're looking at the family of interactions that we can support in particular, one of the, the promising research threads is how we can leverage uncertainty, uncertainty quantification to help the model communicate these regions in which it is not confident about its own segmentation to initiate this kind of a dialogue so that the radiologist can then come inspect the segmentation and perhaps even provide their own input, not just to the model itself, but to that segmentation. So, so extremely, extremely uh, important uh, domain. Uh, thank you, thank you for, for asking about it. Uh, extremely challenging domain, but hopefully, you know, in, um, in the next uh, year or so, we'll be able to, to uh, present you with, with some, some interactions that we have come up with um, that will that will help us move uh, towards uh, explainability of those models. Uh, thank you. So uh, thank you, Arafat. Uh, Arafat is uh, your Oninda's friend. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and one very brilliant and bright student uh, who is working with me as well. So the next question is from uh, another brilliant student from Faisal Rakib Saim. Uh, please, Saim. Uh, I have a question about your beginning of the presentation. It was about the evaluation of driver performance. I, I have a question, which is, can we add a machine learning algorithm which can detect bad sitting posture of a driver and detect anger detection? And we, can we do fusion with your algorithm to detect non between aggressive and non-aggressive drivers? Thank you. Thank you for that question. That, that, is, that is an interesting question. So you probably noticed that uh, we use a very small subset of sensory data that we are able to uh, gather from the car itself through its uh, diagnostic ports. Uh, so it's really the information that the car is reporting about, you know, uh, the position of the, uh, you know, the gas pedal, the braking pedal, the speed of the vehicle, um, and so on and so on. Uh, we did add some of our own sensors in the vehicle uh, to, for example, look at the um, uh, orientation of the steering wheel, and we have considered it in our models. But uh, for us, uh, as we were kind of looking at sort of a proof of concept, uh, we didn't go beyond some of those simple sensors, uh, though we have uh, uh, um, done some tests and some data collection where we also collected massive amounts of uh, video data uh, and also data, uh, like you said, about posture of the driver using different uh, pressure sensitive mats. Uh, unfortunately, interesting uh, to me uh, how detection. So, if you're working on this problem, I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing what you come up. With. I have another question. Can we can we detect anger from seeing driver's face and do machine learning and do fusion? So, so what what you're asking about is another uh, side of the coin of behavior modeling. So, a lot of behavior modeling that I talked about is how actions are how people enact their actions, their physical actions. Uh, but the other side of the coin is how they enact their emotions. Uh, and uh, actually there's a colleague here at the University of Michigan called Emily Moore Provost, who does uh, this kind of work, effective computing, uh, looks at the ability to detect affect uh, and to relate it to uh, people's uh, you know, environment and, and the tasks that they're trying to perform. Uh, I just want to caution anybody doing research in this space. I mean, I, I would like to caution people doing research in, in, in my own space where we are detecting people's actions, but more so uh, uh, when detecting uh, people's emotions. Uh, because as you can see, um, these kinds of uh, models enable uh, unprecedented surveillance systems where you can actually look at someone before you even talk to them, run it through the model and say, is this person angry? 
does this person have any mental uh, disabilities? That, is this person somebody that I want to hire for the job? And so on and so on. This kind of privacy intrusive technologies are really, really, um, um, what's the right word? You have to be really, really careful how you go about it. So, so before you actually create any of these kinds of models, I, I would strongly recommend to look at some of the, the research that looks at ethical um, uh, implications of this kind of work and what are the situations in which having that kind of system actually has a benefit to the person, benefit to the society more broadly versus just benefiting, uh, I don't know, uh, some kind of a, you know, a corporation or a, or a large organization or, or a government agency. Uh, thank you. So next question is from Mr. Samin Yasser. Samin. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Nicola, for your uh, presentation. Uh, I am a student of last year for, uh, of electrical and electronic engineering University of Dhaka. So my question is, uh, using this deep learning model and AI, uh, now we are uh, facing COVID. So uh, in contract facing or this sort of thing, uh, can you use this uh, deep learning model or artificial intelligence to trace the context of uh, a person who is currently uh, attacked by COVID or who has died by COVID? Uh, this can really help us uh, in this situation right now. And that's my second question is, uh, people are giving personal data. So uh, can there be a security issue? Yeah, th these are both uh, excellent questions. Uh, so yes, th there are many different models. Uh, some of them are used uh, to improve contact tracing. Uh, some of them are there to try to forecast uh, who will get COVID, uh, what are going to be the transmission rates of COVID so to support better planning of responses. Uh, some of them actually determine uh, the risk that different patients are at uh, and uh, help in decision making in hospitals, uh, who to put on a ventilator, who not to put on the ventilator. Basically, they're used to um, uh, uh, decide where different resources uh, can go. These models are used everywhere. It is, it is, uh, it is overwhelming. Uh, but I have to also again say that a lot of researchers working on these models, I asked them about it and a lot of them say that there are specific situations in which the models are doing really, really well and there are situations in which they're doing very poorly. And one of the, the situations in which they're doing very poorly is forecasting. They're able to forecast, you know, uh, one or two days ahead, uh, but, they really cannot forecast these kinds of uh, transmission rates uh, further out. And part of the reason is because uh, they are not necessarily taking into account the actual underlying processes, the socio-technical processes that generate this data. How um, uh, a virus is transmitted is a social problem. So, we cannot just throw a bucket of data into an algorithm and, and expect that the algorithm will understand the underlying social processes that generate this data. Uh, so that's one of the things that, uh, that, uh, that you have mentioned. Uh, but you then pointed out a, a broader, bigger issue, and that is, is it ethical? Are there privacy concerns? Are there security concerns? And yes, there are. Uh, people are not only giving their personal data, which there's always a potential for misuse, uh, both uh, in terms of that data uh, being accessed by some adversarial agents, right? Some, some people who want to misuse that data, uh, but also from the perspective of uh, people trying to corrupt these algorithms, right? There's a, there's a broad research in trying to understand uh, adversarial, uh, not, not generative adversarial networks, but adversarial nature of machine learning, where somebody can put in carefully crafted inputs uh, to uh, mess up a machine learning algorithm. 
Uh, and then finally, going back to uh, my, the, my previous answer, uh, these kinds of um, uh, algorithms can be also used to try. I don't think they can be successful, but try to predict who is likely to get COVID or get some kind of disease. And imagine the stigmatization that that can carry with, uh, with itself, where there's an algorithm saying, oh, this person is likely to get COVID and they don't even have COVID. Right? So again, I agree that there's a lot of benefits and there's a lot of potential for uh, using the technology that we have today to do some kind of good, good for the society. But we have to be very, very careful. We cannot just rush into applying some of these systems, especially if we are not able to, sh uh, to show uh, how and why they make certain decisions. Right? That goes back to explainability. Um, before we can actually um, interpret what does it mean uh, for them to make a, a, a certain kind of decision. Again, going back to interpretability and even trying to understand what is the output that they are giving us, which goes back to intelligibility. Okay, yes, thank you. So we have still four or five questions. So, but uh, I just read one uh, from Professor Shiba Udgata from uh, India. So Professor Shiva asked that, don't you think that the advanced ML models are suffering from overfitting problem with the availability of large amount of data and the space is high dimensional? Uh, so that is a very good question. Uh, a lot of um, models that uh, we use uh, do suffer from this kind of problem. Uh, however, it is fairly interesting uh, to note that uh, despite um, our hypothesis that this would happen even with deep learning models, very often this is not the case. Um, I have colleagues who are looking at this from the perspective of theory. They're still trying to explain why is it that deep learning models tend not to overfit on the data. However, however, I have to say one thing. That doesn't mean that they will not learn the wrong thing. And that's where I agree with this observation, with this really good question. How can we tell that these models are not learning something wrong? How can we tell that they're actually learning the, the signal from the processes that generated the data? versus some kind of spurious correlations in the data. That is very, very difficult to tell. And I think one of the main challenges in deep learning is not whether we're going to overfit on, on the data that we have, but whether we're, going to, um, uh, whether we're going to learn the real signal. And then finally, of course, you know, if, you, if you collect data, bias data, right? Uh, you, you do not sample uh, properly. Uh, then yes, you're going to learn uh, only uh, specific things that are contained in that data. But again, I wouldn't necessarily call that as an overfitting problem. I, I would more call that uh, sort of a bias uh, that, that exists in, in um, the selection of data that we have. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of issues, uh, a lot of large companies, you know, Google is, is, has been going through uh, a lot of media uh, about, you know, uh, being very good, for example, to detect uh, people of uh, light skin in, uh, in their photographs, uh, struggling with, uh, you know, uh, people with darker skin. Uh, and, you know, some people are starting to suggest, well, you know, there are biases in, in the data itself, uh, there are biases in the researchers creating these kinds of models and so on and so on. So I'm not trying to dismiss this as an issue. The issue definitely exists, but uh, purely from the mathematical point of view of overfitting, uh, they're, 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 uh, they're not as susceptible uh, like some of the other models are. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful question answer. And uh, next, uh, the question will be asked by Abdullah Al Sajid. Sajid, please unmute. Yeah, and ask. Thank you, sir. I am Abdullah Al Sajid from Tripoli, Dhaka University, first year. Thank you for your talk, uh, Mr. Nicola. I enjoyed it. So, I had a few queries about the bias that you just mentioned. So, I saw that in a few of the tests, the sample was possibly from 
uh, say tech savvy nations, US or Europe. And this model also needs to cater to say much larger audience, such as say South Asian, where the tech savviness is very much less and people are less perceptible to say AI or ML concepts. So how can you aim to improve it and make it a more global for a more global user base first? And secondly, given that uh, we have a high levels of connectivity, there are more data points to collect now and automatically to be collected. So given that they're ethically collected, will more data help improving explainability through feedback systems or say, or does there need to be a different systematic approach to improving explainability? Have we hit a plateau in our current research methods? So I would like an answer from your research perspective. Thank you. Definitely, thank you. This is, this is, a, this is a wonderful question. Um, and you, know, you, you point to a, a very important uh, issue, right? A lot of what I have presented is uh, uh, not uh, just from the Western perspective. It is very much grounded in sort of North America, right? Uh, and and we, we have challenges with this, right, uh, uh, through, throughout. Uh, so uh, I, could, I could potentially, you know, uh, talk about this for, for a whole hour, but I, I do want to pick out on, on some very, very specific things that you, uh, that you mentioned. Um, one thing is uh, we certainly have uh, currently an issue uh, in uh, what are dominant uh, uh, sort of uh, threads of research in academia, uh, where we, we still, especially in North America, we still suffer from uh, uh, influences of uh, the colonial era, right? Uh, the, we are very much informed by uh, you know, uh, colonial era. Uh, we are very much informed by the opportunities that what has happened throughout the colonial era uh, um, uh, that, that enabled for you know, North American, Western um, uh, researchers compared to the, to the rest of the world. And this is something that we have to be sensitive because it's not just about uh, the data that we collect, technology that we create, but also the methods that we have established uh, throughout uh, the years of both you know, colonial and then uh, later on post-colonial um, uh, era. And uh, even now you will see a lot of researchers uh, are looking at uh, sort of these concepts of post-colonial computing and what effects uh, it has on um, disparities uh, in different parts of, of the world. Uh, but you did say something uh, that uh, kind of caught my attention and that is uh, how can we create models or how can we create technology that is more global? Uh, and, um, I would perhaps, uh, I, I don't have an answer, but I would perhaps offer an alternative uh, that, that maybe technology doesn't have to always be global in the sense that one solution fits all. Uh, if, if you look at uh, different uh, countries, different cultures, uh, we, we have different understanding of, of different concepts, of concepts of ethics, of concepts of fairness, of concepts of uh, accountability concepts of trust. And then to say that, uh, you know, one concept uh, should translate and, and automatically, uh, you know, be enforced throughout the world across all of the different cultures, I think is perhaps a little bit uh, misguided or perhaps dangerous in some ways. So instead, I think uh, what we have to look for is giving global opportunities but not necessarily having any particular part of the world di dictating to the rest of the world what they should do and how they should do it. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that explains or, or answers some part of, of your question. The second part was, yeah, we have more of this data, we have more of this global data, uh, but who is to say that uh, we actually have the computational capabilities to account for the diversity that exists in this mess of data? Right? I, I think it's dangerous to propose that, again, we can uh, just by the nature of having more data that we can put it all into one bucket and then, you know, fingers crossed, there's going to be a magical algorithm that will solve all of our, uh, you know, uh, social diversity uh, ethics problems. 
uh, it's probably unlikely. I, I, th I think we, uh, especially as computer scientists, as engineers, as technical people, we also have to broaden our own views and, and think a little bit more about research that, that looks at technology from a, from a critical perspective to better understand what kind of influences this technology has on society, our own society, other societies uh, around us and so on. Uh, thank you. Now I'd like to request uh, uh, Shahamat Tassin. He will ask a question. Mm. Hi, uh, Nicola. Uh, thank you for this amazing session. I am Shahamat Tassin, uh, an under undergraduate student from University of Dhaka. So um, I have two questions, actually. Uh, the first one is a rather simple, a small confusion. That uh, you have used a generator using a generator using GAN uh, on the to, to generate photorealistic images on the discriminator and eventually to fool the discriminator. So did you, uh, were you actually using the output from the uh, discriminator uh, to you know, uh, improve the quality of the photorealistic images? And the second question is, um, what could be the uh, other uses of your approach or your system? I mean, can we use this approach to explore or you know, interpret other DL and ML, um, deep learning or machine learning models that we are going to use in the future. I mean, how feasible is uh, this approach to other models? Thank you. Uh, th thank you for that question. I, I do want to make sure that I understand because um, you were asking, can we, let me just understand. So you were asking, can the outputs of our GAN Explorer or our sampling method be used back in the uh, generator to improve the quality of generated images. Is that is that what you were asking? Uh, yes, since you were, since you said that it's actually trying to fool the uh, discriminator. So uh, is it really is it actually improving uh, with the training or whatever? So so that that's that's a very interesting question. Right now, what we have tried to do is simply uh, create interactions that. Uh, uh, help us understand the capabilities and limitations of the existing model. Uh, we don't have a loop back into it, but uh, there's, there's something interesting there that you're asking. Uh, do I think that we can use those uh, uh, images that we uh, generated to feed it back? Uh, no, not necessarily. The, the generative adversarial network doesn't necessarily work that way. The way the generative adversarial network works is uh, the generator uh, dreams up, <laughs> for the lack of a better word, an image, and then kind of offers it to the discriminator. And then the discriminator says, yes, that's a real image, or no, that isn't a real image. And then the generator responds to that. So there isn't really a feedback loop for the data to go back into uh, the, the generator that is an obvious feedback. Because again, we're not training on an actual uh, data per se, right? Uh, uh, and the other thing, oh, sorry, we are training on actual data, but we're not training on the generated images data. The other thing is to feed the same images into the, um, some kind of a training process for the generator doesn't really make sense because, well, we already generated those. We know that the generator can do that. But with all this said, uh, I do have some uh, thoughts. So if you think about our sampling method, right, using MCMC, what it does, it samples from the posterior distribution of quality images. Now, if you think about how the discriminator, sorry, how the generator works, the way it is generating uh, images to propose to the discriminator, it still uses some of these um, uh, sort of, um, I don't want to say arbitrary, uh, but um, uh, some of these uh, likely probability distributions. So often what it does, it uses actually a normal, uh, truncated normal distribution under the hood to generate some of these images. But imagine if we can use the samples from the posterior probability distribution to estimate that probability distribution, let's say using KDE or, or some other method, and then use that probability distribution in the, in the uh, generator. Because our probability distribution is a mixture of Gaussians, no longer just one, you know, like sampling from a truncated normal distribution. So there, I think perhaps we have some ways to, to provide feedback back into the model 
uh, based on what, what people think um, is, is a, a good set of uh, images. And I'm sorry, you did have one more follow-up question on that, but I, I, I forgot what it was. If you repeat it, I'll try to answer it. Yes, uh, the second question is, uh, can uh, your approach be used on other systems? I mean, can we use this approach to explore or in, interpret other uh, deep learning or machine learning models, or is it feasible to do so? Uh, thank you, thank you, yeah. Uh, thank you for the reminder about that question. Uh, I hope so. Uh, I, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, we, we have some evidence to show that uh, this particular approach works on one particular model. We have some other evidence from other work that uh, interactions can help understand what the model is, is doing, what kind of decision it is making. That is actually the point of, of future work for this research thread, to start looking at different uh, different kinds of models, start looking at the different kinds of interactions. Uh, you know, we, we, we presented work with uh, GAN that generates images, but there are now GANs that generate uh, sounds, music, right? What kind of an interface would you have to uh, create to explore, uh, you know, a space of uh, automatically generated high fidelity audio, audio clips or music? and so on and so on. So all of this is really an open question. Uh, and not only am I very interested in exploring it, I'm also very interested in seeing what others do and how they build on, on our existing work uh, to come up with, with a whole family of, of interactive tools for model exploration. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So we have uh, uh, another question, uh, Fazler Abi, may you unmute? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Nicola Benovic, and also I would like to thank Atul Rahman uh, Ahasar for arranging this wonderful session. I am Emily Fozer Rabbi Afsar, uh, a uh, postgraduate student uh, from Jagannath University, Department of Chemistry. Uh, I also study psychology. So my question is related uh, is to mental health. As we know that uh, uh, the mental health cases is increasing day by day, uh, and also there is a um, there is a relation between uh, this increasing this case to the technology. So I, I, my question is, uh, do you think that this human AI interaction uh, could increase such kind of mental health case more and more? Uh, that's a very good question, but I have to answer it in, in two different ways. Um, first, I, I, I just want to acknowledge one thing. Uh, technology is not always the answer to every single social problem that we have. We are suffering, we broadly, people are, are suffering from many kinds of, you know, male, uh, mental ailments. Uh, and, and some of them, you know, stem from various, um, uh, various, uh, you know, reasons, right? Uh, looking at what are the causes of these ailments, looking at uh, proper treatment, support for, for people who uh, uh, suffer from these, uh, uh, from these conditions, uh, through policy, through healthcare, is, is probably going to do more than what we can do to patch up some of these issues through technology. Because right now, if you look at how a lot of work is positioned, there are these fundamental problems that, that happen. And now all we do is use technology to detect when somebody has a, a problem instead of trying to help them solve that problem. Most of the work. There is some work where uh, technology plays an important role in diagnostics, plays an important role in supporting clinicians, in uh, providing support to people, uh, provides even self-help. Uh, it's still challenging to provide self-help. I'm not an expert in this domain, so I, I, I can only tell you sort of uh, my, my observations. Uh, you know, some experts may tell you more about the effectiveness of some of these self-help uh, uh, technologies. Uh, but uh, I, think, I think it's important to uh, think about technology as a support tool for end users and domain experts, 
versus this magical decision maker that will come in and, and you know, solve all of our problems. Uh, so with, with that said, yes, uh, again, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing uh, a um, in, uh, in some of these uh, technologies. A lot of my colleagues are specifically, you know, focusing on, on affect detection. Uh, there is some promise, but while there is a promise, we have to be very, very careful about how we approach these technologies. Oh, thank you, thank you. So there is uh, another question in the chat box uh, from Tahia. Uh, it's about, is it possible to have 100% training accuracy in a deep learning model? Uh, so I'm gonna say yes, uh, but there's more to that answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you have an extremely simple problem that you can solve with an if then else statement, yeah, you can probably even get uh, you know 100% training accuracy. You can actually force your accuracy to be 100%. It goes back to some of the overfitting um, you know questions from earlier in the talk. But the question is, do you want to run a deep learning model on such a simple problem? The reason why we have machine learning, why we have deep learning, is this understanding that some problems are. Um, inherently ambiguous. I don't necessarily uh, you know, think that, that they're handling that ambiguity well. Uh, I think we as computer scientists and engineers, we have challenges of understanding the sources of ambiguity and what ambiguity actually means in, in real world uh, problems. Uh, we understand you know, noise, bias, uh, variance, those kinds of things, sure. Uh, but, but, but other sources of ambiguity, I, I don't think we necessarily uh, properly understand uh, when it comes to different other domains. Uh, so the question shouldn't be, is it possible? The question is, is that kind of a model useful for anything? And if it's not 100% accurate, what implication does that have for using that kind of a model in real world settings? Thank you. So we have uh, one more question, probably the last one, because there is no other candidates uh, from the audience, but I have a question. So uh, Mr. Farhan Fuhad Abir, may you ask? Hello, Professor Benavik. I'm Fuad from the University of Dhaka. So thank you for your amazing presentation. But uh, when you're talking about the ethical implications of the technology, regarding the human behavior analysis. So uh, this question came into my mind that the, in the first presentation that uh, you uh, were detecting the aggressive behavior of drivers. So uh, was it uh, used further as an awareness application or uh, it was just a research? And, and if it was used, then uh, was there any ethical implications in that application? Uh, so just to answer your question uh, first about whether it was used later on, no, we left it at the level of a research prototype. We never really deployed it into a real product. Um, whether it is just research um, artifact, uh, research prototype, or whether it was an actual product, I think ethical considerations remain. Um, and, uh, you know, I am not uh, one who would say don't ever create this kind of technology. You see me create this kind of technology. Right. So I, I would be a hypocrite to say, don't do it. Uh, but I think one of the things that we have to do uh, is constantly reflect on ethical implications. So, for example, if I were to use this kind of a model uh, and deploy it, uh, you know, to an insurance company so that insurance companies can constantly monitor someone and um, uh, constantly, uh, maybe even try to predict if somebody is aggressive before they're aggressive to change their uh, premiums, let's say. Uh, then, you know, uh, hopefully in, in your mind that is raising some ethical uh, concerns. Um, if we build these models into, you know, behavior aware interfaces where only the user has access to the model, only the user has access to their data, then we are not removing, but we are minimizing some of these risks. Uh, so, so I think we have the responsibility to always think about these, uh, uh, these implications because you will never have 100% ethical uh, uh, system uh, for various reasons. Uh, if nothing else, uh, you can have two people disagreeing on what is ethical. 
uh, to begin with. Um, and the second consideration is that there's always trade-offs that we need to make. Wor a world is not uh, something that uh, we as engineers, although we love doing this, uh, that we can optimize. Right? There, there are always trade-offs uh, and there's always uh, a lot of dynamics inside of those trade-offs. Trade uh, so so that, that's why you know, I, I think we, we have to constantly be thinking about the ethical implications. But there's another thing that I wanna, that I wanna point out here. You know, I talk a lot about ethics and I, I mention ethics, uh, but please note that I'm not an expert in this kind of work. If you truly want to uh, you know, uh, look at research that specifically uh, talks about methods for critically assessing technology, for work that actually critically assesses technology, uh, you have to look at it in uh, adjacent fields. You have to look into the field of SDS or science, technology, and society. And there you will find a lot of uh, interesting um, uh, critiques of the things that we do from the perspective of the good and the harm uh, that this technology has on the society more broadly. Oh, thank you. So we have uh, one more question from, uh, by the way, uh, Nicola, is it okay, your time? I, I only have uh, uh, four more minutes. Okay, so I'll not ask my question. So this is the first question. Malisha, please. Thank you, Professor, for your nice presentation. Um, I'm Malisha from Toputi, currently studying in third year, Department of Tripoli, University of Dhaka. So my question is, we all know that uh, feature extraction is one of the important parts. So which as aspects or criteria should be followed to extract features when we use machine learning models for training? Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. So um, what I'm going to say may be a little bit uh, controversial. Um, but you have to understand that, um, you know, uh, that, that I'm coming from um, more of a perspective of uh, what we like to call forward models, right? Uh, so um, I'm very much interested in uh, creating computational models where, where we sort of create the parameters and, and, and set up the model itself and the dynamics of the model based on the existing knowledge and then we compared with the empirical data. So very, sorry, very often, uh, I don't necessarily use uh, specifically machine learning to learn the model from the data. Instead, I propose the model uh, based on uh, the main expertise. And, and, and that has its drawbacks. Usually those kind of models are smaller. Uh, They're not capturing all of the, um, you know, well, no model captures all of the aspects of reality, but they, they certainly can capture less parameters than some of the, the machine learning models that, uh, you know, use a bucket of data to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, to uh, learn the relationships between uh, different features. So from that perspective, uh, most of the features that, that I select in my models are informed by existing knowledge, by domain expertise. Uh, I am also pragmatic. So I do combine some of these methods, but I am leaning towards, towards that approach. Note that there's many wonderful, excellent methods uh, in applied machine learning for feature selection. A lot of them grounded in works of statisticians that are principled, uh, and there are really uh, uh, beneficial to your training. What I would say is almost I would defer this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of a question to somebody who uh, knows more about feature selection, but I do wanna offer as an alternative that, that you can uh, actually uh, select these features yourself uh, from the semantics of uh, the, the process uh, that you're trying to model uh, based on existing knowledge. And of course, there are a lot of uh, also Bayesian methods that uh, later on help you sort of uh, better understand the effects of some of these uh, uh, features that you select uh, manually. Uh, but I'm not an expert on, on automated feature selection uh, methods. Uh, wonderful. So thank you so much, uh, Nicola. 
Uh, so uh, if you have time, then maybe we can take another question, but as you don't, so <laughs> uh, we'd like Unfortunately, to- Unfortunately, I really have to get going, uh, but thank you all so much for, for wonderful questions. These were, these were very, very interesting, uh, and, and I'm really looking forward to seeing where you take uh, your own work, uh, things that you've mentioned, how you integrate perhaps some of the, the knowledge that I, uh, that I presented here today. So I, I look forward to uh, seeing all of your work. Yeah, but Nicola, uh, it's a genuinely wonderful talk and so many, I mean, wonderful answers. And uh, uh, my, my goodness, I mean, students, all of the questions uh, are from uh, young students and uh, their questions are uh, all excellent. So, I mean, uh, thought provoking. So I'm very happy that uh, our kids are thinking, which is uh, wonderful. So with that, I thank uh, Professor Nicola for your wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation and uh, time for this uh, talk. And uh, for that, before I conclude, just to invite for the next talk uh, before Ramadan, which is 12 April, Monday, it's about how to reply to reviewers, like review rebuttals. Uh, so basically I'll try to answer some of the questions and also learn from others uh, who will attend uh, based on your experiences. So there is no clear answer. Uh, but uh, I'll try. And uh, uh, we'd like to invite you all to submit papers in 10th ICIV, which uh, and uh, or fifth IV pair uh, uh, in August 2021 in Japan, uh, both on site and online uh, in uh, dual mode. And both conferences were, uh, I mean, their date of birth, <laughs> I mean, 10 years and five years before in Bangladesh. And we organized in Japan as well as in USA. And in USA, Nicola also attended and presented. Uh, a keynote. So with that, I conclude the, um, uh, uh, I mean, session and uh, thank you all. I uh, hope to see you again uh, and uh, enjoy and remain safe. Uh, thank you so much. Nicola, uh, I mean, I hope that uh, based on our plan after the corona is over, we'll meet each other uh, multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> thank Definitely. you. Thank you all again. Yeah. Real thank pleasure. you. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much.